everyone. My name is Lori Pasteryak, and I'm coming to you live from the museum's exhibition, Creating Community. And I wanted to say a good hello uh, this afternoon, and I'm here to talk a little bit about farming in its history in Fairfield here in Connecticut. Once again, the museum is currently closed to the public, but we are bringing you these awesome live events as well as other virtual events and content via social media like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if you're interested in seeing on what we have coming up, you can always find us online at our website, www.fairfieldhistory.org. And at our website, you can not only see the things that we have coming up, but you can also make a donation, a contribution, or re-up your membership, uh, which we would deeply appreciate um, and always are thankful for your support. So right now, again, I'm in the museum um, in our exhibition titled Creating Community, 375 Years of Fairfield's Past. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about farming and farming the land and farmers here in Fairfield and in this region. So I'm actually standing in the central part of the permanent exhibition where we're looking at Fairfield's history from after the American Revolution and probably up until about 1915. So from 1800 until 1900, it's the 19th century. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, natural resources and uh, the fair fields of Fairfield and why this region is so important to the people um, that's lived here and the land and the resources that have been accessible for hundreds of thousands of years. So why would someone, why would someone want to live in Fairfield? For of course we have the, um, number one, the region itself, we are accessible to Long Island Sound and all of the resources that are accessible from the ocean as well as the marshes, which provide um, a bountiful uh, food as well as uh, materials for tools and just natural ways of living. And then you also have the beautiful fields and water fail, water, waterways that come down from the north into the south. So Fairfield not only has access to the beach and all of the natural resources that come from the ocean, but also the um, land and the fields and the forests that exist in the north and beyond the beach community. So before European colonization in the 15th century and prior, you had native communities living in this area taking advantage of all of the natural resources uh, that the region provided. Um, native peoples certainly farmed the land. They had a strong subsistent culture using agricultural um, management as well as a variety of ways to manage the forest and clear the fields. Uh, and you know, post-European colonization, starting in the 1630s, here in 1639, after the Pequot War, um, you had um, you know the European way of farming, uh, as well as splitting up of the land, individual ownership of the land, uh, and uh, you know different ways of using the land as uh, you know finding it as farming and natural resources. So it's been a really interesting, um, if you look around here for today, you of course don't think about farms. You see uh, certainly lots of suburbia, you see lots of businesses, you see um, you know, uh, homes next to homes. You don't really see the fair fields that Fairfield was once known for. And so as time went on, you know, post-1600, uh, you know, farming is a, certainly a way of life. It's not only just a way of life that some may view as simple, but it's actually very complex. Farming depends on the weather. It depends on the resources. It depends on um, the market, of course, because not only do farmers and farming help produce for your own self, but your own family, it also produces for sell selling and the way of life. Um, and here in Fairfield, with access to the ocean and transportation and shipping and abroad, um, especially in the 19th century, where we're standing right here, um, markets and farming became a huge resource for the area. So farmers are not only controlled by the markets, but they're also controlled by things like the weather. Um, right now, we're in early May. We've had a rather brisk um, or spring uh, growing season. 
We had a winter time that didn't have a lot of snow. Um, all of these things will actually affect moving forward um, of how the season uh, produced. But farmers, of course, work all year round. And what you're seeing behind me right now in this farming, um, this agricultural area in the exhibition, is a variety of things to understand what a farmer's life might have been like in the 19th century. And here at the museum, we have um, access to things like primary sources. For example, we have Hall Sherwood's diary from the late 18th and 19th century that on a daily basis, he not only recorded things like the weather and what he did, um, as well as people he spoke with and things that were sold to, things that he needed. Um, he also talks about perhaps um, someone who um, he cared for very deeply. So we get a lot of insight into farmers' way of life um, through their primary sources, especially things like diaries, which are very important to anybody who runs a business. So that way they can understand their ebb and flow of life and what they had needed last year, what they might need this year at this time. So those diaries are really key into understanding people's daily lives as well as farmers. So behind me here, uh, I have a gentleman named Hezekiah Banks III. And Hezekiah Banks is an interesting person because in the 19th century, he not only was a farmer, but he also had a side job as a cobbler. And we actually have his cobbler's bench here in the exhibition. So not only did farmers have a way of life in the sense of, you know, on a daily basis of producing um, not only fruits and vegetables, but also raising livestock, um, as well as developing other products like flax, so that way people had access to things like clothing and linen, um, producing those raw materials, but they also had side jobs. Um, Hezekiah Banks happened to be a cobbler, so we have his tools and his bench here. But farmers also found ways to be incredibly inventive. And here in Fairfield, we have some really interesting people who developed items uh, to help them uh, build their farms and build their produce, as well as access and um, into the market uh, patents, um, as well as inventing other objects. One of my favorite things that we have on display here, and you're not going to be able to see a detail of it, but I'll upload a picture later, uh, is a patent model, which is from a gentleman named Arthur Sherwood, who is actually the son of Hull Sherwood that I mentioned earlier that we have his diary. And this patent model, as you can see it, is actually a mini version of a barn door latch. And this patent model was made by Arthur H. Sherwood uh, from Southport, Connecticut, and he applied for a patent and received it. And this is kind of um, a lock that would allow your barn door to actually catch, and it actually still works, this little mini patent model. It's, it's pretty adorable, and he actually inscribed it as well. And this is a recent acquisition into our collection that we included when we redid this part of creating community. So, you know, in terms of farmers and their work and their development, a lot of the interesting things that came out of this period, not to mention Sherwood, but also, also uh, Jellis uh, and company, who produced a whole series of larger uh, tools, especially those to work with onions. And we all know and love the Southport Globe onions. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those tools and the farming way of life um, later this week, probably tomorrow, uh, when we do our This Old Thing, and I can share some more agricultural tools from the museum's collection. I also have behind me a great view, um, a great lithograph um, called the Greenfield Mills um, from Fairfield's history. So this is about an 1850 depiction of life up in Greenfield Hill. We're lucky to have this as part of our collection that we were able to share here in Creating Community. If you have any questions or suggestions for the future or any specific agricultural questions you have, please feel free to post them or share them um, here on Facebook. Um, the museum is also working to add all of these videos up onto YouTube, and so you'll be able to access this here on Facebook or on YouTube anytime in the future. But we're looking at this really interesting agricultural period, um, and I'm going to be talking about in the future the transition from the agricultural Fairfield 
into a more suburban Fairfield, which happened nearly 100 years later. So in the mid 20th century, Fairfield really transitions from a land and field um, community where farming was the huge resource to more of a business and suburban community in the 19th in, in the 1940s and 50s. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to see you. Thanks for all that liked and loved. I saw your little comments coming in. And if you have any questions again in the future, please reach out to us. Um, you can reach us on our website at www.fairfieldhistory.org. You can comment on any of the videos or photos that we upload here. And you can also um, reach out into any other way you might need. Again, thanks so much. You can, of course, we would appreciate any donation or contribution or for those who are not a member to become a member of a family here at the Fairfield Museum. We look forward to continue to connect with you virtually and we hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining. Bye.